Well, let me encourage you at this time to take a copy of God's Word and to open it with me to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17 this morning will be our point of departure as we continue our current sermon series in the book of Proverbs called Gaining a Life of Wisdom. Proverbs chapter 17 in your copy of God's Word. One of Anna and I's favorite shows to watch is a show called Monk. Some of you are familiar with the show. I already hear chuckles about it. The show's, the show's title comes from the name of the main char character, Adrian Monk, who is a private detective who works for the San Francisco Police Department. And in the show, Adrian Monk is the police department's greatest detective. There's really no one that can compare to Adrian Monk. He's smart. He's highly intelligent, he's calculating, he's knowledgeable. He has a unique ability to see and interpret clues and data that no one else has the ability to see and interpret. He can draw conclusions and make inferences where everyone else is just drawing blanks. He has a special ability to think critically, rationally, and quickly on the spot. He can make connections that no one else is able to make. As far as intellectual abilities and smarts go, there's really no one that can match Adrian Monk. He's in a category all by himself. But what's interesting about Adrian Monk is that for all of his special abilities and all of his intellectual strengths, he's a relational dullard. He's completely incompetent when it comes to relationships. When it comes to the area of personal relationships, he's an amateur, he's clumsy, he doesn't know how to gain or maintain relationships. He drives the people around him absolutely crazy. He regularly offends them when he doesn't even mean to. He speaks up when he shouldn't say anything. He remains silent when he should say something. He has trouble tuning in to people's emotional needs. When it comes to solving crimes, there's no one else like him. Adrian Monk is brilliant. But when it comes to maintaining relationships, He's incompetent, he's an amateur, he's a dullard. And the reality is this morning that we all know people in life who are a lot like that. We all know people in life who are highly intelligent, who are smart, savvy, rational, they're logical in their thinking, but they're relationally foolish. People who can grasp difficult con concepts they can grasp and process and interpret complex data. They can mess, uh, make impressive business deals. They can out-argue and out-reason all their opponents, but their relationships are in shambles. For all their intellectual savvy and smarts, the people close to them, people like their spouse, their kids, their friends, their coworkers, those people are often hurting, offended, and emotionally distant. And the question this morning is why? Why is that the case? How is it that incredibly smart people can be relational dullards? How does that happen? Well, the reason is because there's another ingredient that's necessary for healthy, successful, God-honoring relationships. And it's what the Bible calls wisdom. Wisdom. In the area of personal relationships, wisdom is the ability to gain and maintain strong, healthy, God-honoring relationships. Wisdom is the ability to understand and process the emotions of the people around you. Wisdom is the skill to be, to, to be able to know what to say and how to say certain things. It's to know when to speak and when not to speak. Wisdom is the ability to know how to build up and encourage the people around you. It's the skill to know how to correct someone and how to handle conflict. Wisdom is the ability to know how to be a good friend and how to discern and adapt to the needs of the relationships around you. In other words, wisdom is the ability to develop and nurture relationships according to God's good design. You see, intelligence alone is not enough for healthy, successful, God-honoring relationships. You also need wisdom. Well, in Proverbs chapter 17, King Solomon is going to talk to us this morning about this relational wisdom. This wisdom that's necessary for us to have if we're going to experience healthy, successful, God-honoring relationships. 
A wisdom that if we take to heart and we apply to our relationships has the potential to transform and strengthen every relationship and every sphere of our lives. So look with me at Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9, where we see King Solomon lay out for us two paths that we can take in our relationships. Two paths that lie before us. One path that leads to relational strife, destruction, and disunity, and another path that leads to relational peace, strength, and that will bring honor to God. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9. He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. The English Standard Version of the Bible words it slightly differently. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. The New Living Translation puts it like this. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. The Living Bible, another English translation of the Bible, puts it like this. Whoever covers up an offense seeks love. Whoever repeats a matter separates close friends. King Solomon says that there are two paths that we can take in our relationships. Two paths that stand before us. The first one, the one that's lacking in relational wisdom, the one that's lacking in relational understanding, the one that's sure to damage our relationships is this. Fixate on someone's faults and damage the relationship. Fixate, latch on to someone's faults and hurt the relationships. That, that's what Solomon means in the second half of the verse. If you fixate on someone's faults, if you keep bringing up their past sins and their past mistakes, if you latch on to the, a past hurt, if you keep dredging up their history and throwing it in their face, if you keep a record of wrongs, if you keep reminding them over and over again of how they failed you, then there's a high probability that you're going to destroy the relationship. There's a high probability that the, re that the relationship is going to suffer. Fixate on someone's faults, latch on to an offense, and you're going to destroy the relationship. Now the offense that this proverb is talking about, the offense could be a past sin or a past failure. It could be something that happened in your relationship's past, right? It could also be someone's present shortcomings or faults. It could be an annoying habit or a personality quirk. It could be an ill-timed word or a harshly stated criticism. The, the offense that this proverb speaks of could be a regretful moment in a heated exchange. It could be an unintentional slight. It could be an intentional slight. It could be something that you said you've forgiven this person of, but you still just can't seem to let go of. Solomon says that if we continue to latch on to people's sins, if we continue to fixate on their failures, we continually dredge up the past, well then before long, the relationship is going to be in the past. Fixate on someone's faults and damage the relationship. Refuse to let faults go. Continually bring them up. Remind the person of how they failed you over and over. And you're going to separate a close friend. In their book, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, which, by the way, is if you are seriously uh, dating or you're engaged, I highly recommend this book. It's one of the books that I take our premarital couples through, or at least several chapters of the book. But in their book, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, marriage counselors Les and Leslie Parrott talk about the marital strife and the destruction that can occur from holding on to a past offense, even when that past offense has nothing to do with the spouse. In their book, they describe a 31-year-old woman named Janice who came to them one day for counseling. Janice had just experienced a bitter divorce after just three years of marriage. And while she was angry and resentful toward her ex-husband for his many faults and his many failures, the primary focus of her anger and her resentment was actually toward her father. She was angry at him. She believed that all of her current problems in life, including her failed marriage, could be traced back to the offenses that were done to her by her father. She couldn't let go of those offenses. She latched on to them. 
and it affected her marriage, ending in divorce. Doctors Les and Leslie Parrott describe this phenomenon as the revolving door ledger. They say this about the revolving door. They say the revolving door ledger is when you displace the blame for past hurts onto your spouse. At certain periods in your life, someone or something hurts you, running up a series of emotional debts. Time passes, and you walk through life's revolving door, and now you hand your spouse the bill, and you hold two hidden expectations. First, prove to me that you are not the person who hurt me. In other words, make up to me for my past hurt. Pay me back for what someone else did. And secondly, if you do one thing that reminds me of, the, of that past hurt, I will punish you for it. When this happens, say the authors, the emotional transfer is accomplished from someone who actually committed to the offense, the offense to someone who had nothing to do with it, the revolving door ledger. I think King Solomon would actually agree with that assessment. I think he would agree with the fact that holding on to past offenses, even when those past offenses don't have to do with our spouse, is destructive to our relationships. And this morning, through King Solomon, God is telling us that whoever repeats the matter, whoever repeats the offense, whoever latches on to a fault, separates close friends. What does it mean to repeat the matter? What does it mean to latch on to an offense or a fault? Well, to repeat the matter might mean that you dredge up a past offense or a failure in a present conversation. You know that that past offense has nothing to do with what you're currently talking about right now, but you bring it up anyway so that you can win the argument. That could be what it means to repeat the matter. Repeating the matter might mean that we refuse to act lovingly or warmly or accepting toward the person that offended us. Repeating the matter might mean that we give the cold shoulder or we act passively aggressive toward the person that offended us. To repeat the matter might mean that we go and we tell other people about the, the offense or the situation, even when it has nothing to do with them. And there's a word for that in the Bible. It's called gossip. Repeating the matter sometimes looks like gossiping, telling people who have no business about the issue, telling them about the issue. And according to King Solomon, this is the first path that we can take in our relationships. We can go down that road. We can take that path. We can fixate on people's faults. We can dredge up their past. We can continually throw their past mistakes in their faces. We can hold it over their heads. We can refuse to let things go. We can gossip about it with other people. We can punish that person for how they've offended us. We can do that. That's a path that you can take in your relationships. But doing so, Solomon says, will ensure that the relationship gets damaged or even destroyed. It's to ensure that a close friendship, a close relationship, will get separated. Latch on to someone's faults, refuse to let things go, continually dredge up the past, bring things into the light that don't need to be brought into the light, and lose a relationship. That's the first path that we can take in our relationships. That's the path of relational foolishness, the path of fixating on other people's faults. But there's another path that we can take in our relationships. And it's one that is rich in biblical wisdom and biblical understanding. And it's one that will lead to health and strength and that will bring honor to God in our relationships. And it's this. Overlook an offense and promote lo love. Overlook an offense and promote love. That's what Solomon says in the first part of Proverbs 17, 9. He says, he who covers over an offense promotes love. Solomon says that the way that we can strengthen our, our relationships, the way that we can nurture and maintain good relationships is by being willing to overlook certain offenses from time to time. Being willing to do that. It, it means being willing to absorb certain infractions, slights, and faults. It means that we have the, the discernment to recognize that in order to preserve this relationship, in order to promote love, it's sometimes best to simply ignore a criticism or a grievance, to not make a mountain out of a molehill, to just let it go, 
to not bring it out into the open. Why? Not because you're trying to cover up someone's sins or faults, but because you recognize I'm going to preserve the relationship. It's not worth bringing this up. It's not worth bringing it out into the open. Doing so would only hurt the relationship. Solomon says sometimes it's wiser to just overlook an offense. So what does it mean to cover over an offense? What might it look like to overlook an offense? Well, to cover over an offense might mean that we overlook certain offenses that, that, that bug us. It, it might mean that we learn to absorb a slight or a snub, and we don't worry about getting even with someone. It means that we refuse to enslave someone to their past mistakes. It means that we refuse to continually, continue, continually remind someone of how they have fallen short in the relationship. It means that we recognize that in the grand scheme of things, there are certain offenses that are just not worth bringing up. They're just not worth making a big deal over. To cover over an offense might mean that the offender has already asked for forgiveness, and now we have committed to never bringing the issue up again. It's buried, it's in the past, we're not gonna hold it over their heads. We're not gonna punish them for a past mistake. Right? We're, we're not going to hold a grudge or nurse a grudge against them for a past mistake. Solomon says that the relationally wise person, the person who knows how to promote love in their relationships, is the person who knows how and when to cover over an offense. They know the situation in which it's appropriate to just overlook an offense and not make a big deal out of it. Now, if you're like me this morning, you may be wondering to yourself, is Solomon encouraging us to excuse people's sins? Is that what this proverb is teaching us? Is he telling us that we should just pretend like people's sins don't exist? Is he saying that we should just never point out another person's sins or faults? That we should never bring a genuine offense out into the open? That we should always just cover it? Well, the answer to that is no. That's not what Solomon is saying in this proverb. He's not telling us that there's never a time to go to someone about their sin and to point out the way in which they've wronged us. That's not what he's saying. This is the same Solomon who wrote in Proverbs 27, 5 and 6, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Uh, the word there in Proverbs 27, 5 for open is the word public. Better is public rebuke than hidden love. There's a time for public rebuke. There's a time to bring things out into the open. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. There's a time in which friends need to wound one another, when they need to bring the issue into the light. So Solomon isn't saying that we can never go to someone about their sin, that we can never bring issues out into the light. Rather, what he's saying in Proverbs 17, 9 is that there is a time and there is a place in which it's wiser to simply overlook an offense rather than to make a big deal out of it. There, there are times in which it's more prudent in a relationship and more beneficial to the relationship to simply absorb an offense rather than bring it up, to just absorb it. Sometimes it's better and more sensible to simply let an offense go, to not bring it out into the open, but to just let it go. Don't fixate on it. But it takes wisdom. It takes prudence. It takes discernment to know which offenses should simply be let go and which offenses should be addressed, brought out into the open, not ignored. But according to Proverbs 17:9, there are times where it is wiser, it's more prudent, it's more beneficial to the relationship to overlook an offense. As I was preparing for this sermon, I came across a story about a pastor who has a thriving ministry, a thriving, growing church, a man who has extreme integrity and extreme honor, a man who does everything above board. He is, as Paul says, a man above reproach. His congregation trusts him. He's a faithful, true shepherd. But in the course of a certain church controversy, he was accused by a member of the church of covering up someone's sins. That was the word that this person used of the pastor. He covered up someone's sins. Now, the person that was guilty of the sin had already told the pastor about this particular sin. 
He went to the pastor. He told the pastor what had happened. He laid out all the details. He confessed the sin. He repented of the sin. And then the pastor accepted the confession, accepted that repentance, promised that they would keep it confidential and that they would move on. The man went to the pastor, told him everything, and they moved on. But sometime later, the details of this particular sin came to light. And a member of the church went to the pastor and again accused him of covering up this man's sins. And in reply, the pastor responded in a very tongue-in-cheek manner. He said, I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd. I cover up people's sins for a living. It's part of my job. Now, obviously, that's a bit of an over-exaggeration. That's a bit of an overstatement. He was being tongue-in-cheek. But hopefully you get his point. What this pastor is saying is that sometimes it takes wisdom to know which offenses should be brought out into the open and which offenses should be spared the spotlight, which should be kept confidential. And according to Proverbs 17.9, there are times when it's wiser to keep the circle of the no tight to not bring it out into the open, to keep it confidential between a pastor and a congregant. There are times in which wisdom says, cover over this offense, conceal it. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, which some of you may have, translates Proverbs 17.9 this way. Whoever conceals an offense promotes love, but whoever gossips about it separates friends. There is a time and there is a place to conceal an offense. There is a time to spare offenses from the spotlight, sparing offenses from not going to people who have nothing to do with it and sharing it with them. There's a time to conceal an offense and not gossip about it. You see, the reality is that in any given church, there is enough sin and enough baggage and junk and darkness among the members of the church that if it were all to be made known, everyone would be the worse for it. If the pastors of this church were to tell everything we know about some of you, and if some of you were to tell everything you know about some of us, it would ruin good relationships. It would cause unnecessary division. It would imprudently affect our community. And far from promoting love in our relationships, it would actually damage our relationships. Imprudently so. Now again, As Solomon points out elsewhere in the book of Proverbs, there is a time for accountability. There is a time for open rebuke. There is a time to bring issues to the light. There is a time for church discipline in which the congregation needs to be made known aware of an issue. But there are also times in our relationships in the course of the church when in order to promote love, wisdom would dictate that we simply cover over an offense that we not bring it out into the open, that we not rehearse it with people that it has nothing to do with, that we not air it out, that we not broadcast it to people who aren't involved. But again, it takes wisdom and prudence and discernment to know how and when to do this, to know how and when to bring an issue to light and how and when to conceal it. King Solomon says, he who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Well, those are the paths before us. Those are the two paths that we can take in our relationships. One path that lacks relational wisdom, and that will lead to destruction, division, and disunity, and the other path that is full of relational wisdom, and that will lead to love, unity, and honor to God in our relationships. You see, what King Solomon is saying in this proverb is that if we want to have healthy, God-honoring relationships, then we're going to have to learn to overlook certain offenses from time to time. We're going to have to learn to overlook and to cover over certain offenses. We're going to have to learn to develop the wisdom of knowing how and when to overlook certain issues. We're going to have to develop the skill of knowing when it's more prudent to simply cover over an offense and let it go rather than to bring it up and make an issue out of it. And again... Just to be clear, we're not talking about offenses that might be considered serious legal matters. That's not what this proverb is talking about. We're not talking about issues like abuse or theft or some other serious crime that might might have been done to you. We're not talking about issues of church discipline that in the course of church discipline is appropriate to tell the church. We're not talking about those issues. 
The offenses that we're talking about are those offenses that are bound to take place when you stick two sinners together in close proximity. The general biblical principle is that if you want to keep your relationships intact, if you want to promote love, then you're going to have to learn to cover over certain offenses from time to time. You're going to have to learn to develop the skill of Proverbs 17, 9. But what do you do if you feel like there's an issue that needs to be brought to the light? What do you do if you feel like there's an issue that's big enough or important enough or it's bothering you enough that you feel like it needs to be addressed, it needs to be brought out into the open, that it would be unwise to not address this issue? What do you do then? Well, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gives us a path forward. He tells us what to do in this situation. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, Jesus says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. You see, Jesus says that there are situations where wisdom would dictate that we need to go to someone about an offense, that we need to uncover an issue. But he says that when that time arises, when wisdom dictates that it's time to bring an issue to light, he says it needs to happen in a certain way. It needs to happen discreetly, privately, one-on-one, -on -one, and with the purpose of restoring the relationship. That's how we're supposed to go about it. And he says that if your brother listens to you, you've won them over. And you now have the opportunity to apply Proverbs 17, 9 to the situation you now have the opportunity to cover over the offense. You now have the opportunity to never bring it up again, to bury it, to leave it in the past, to not hold it over their heads. Why? Because you've won them over. They've confessed it. They've repented of it. And now you can apply Proverbs 17, 9. A while back, a godly man that I greatly respect and look up to in many ways came to me about an offense of which I was personally guilty. I had said something that didn't sit well with him, and it bothered him enough that he felt that there was a need to bring it up to me. He felt that it was wise that wisdom dictated that he needed to bring this issue to light. And so instead of stewing over the issue, instead of shutting me out or punishing me or telling other people about the issue, he came to me privately and he laid out the issue before me. And he told me what was, what was going on, why it was bothering him. Now, if I'm being completely honest with you, that was a conversation I did not want to have. It was very uncomfortable. It was hard and difficult for me to hear how I had wronged this person and how I needed to now make things right. But as difficult as that conversation was, it ultimately contributed to restoring and strengthening the relationship. There was an issue, and wisdom in this situation dictated that he needed to go to me about it and he went to me about it, privately, one-on-one. -on -one. And to this day, it's as if that conversation never even happened. It's not between us anymore. In my relationship with this person, there's absolutely no hint that my past offense is still bugging him. It's in the past. It's done with. It's not between us. He's never brought the issue up since that initial conversation. And today, our relationship is strong. It's healthy. It's intact. There's no question in my mind that he has covered over my offense. He's overlooked it. He's buried it. I do not have to wonder if he's going to repeat the matter. I don't have to wonder if he's going to hold it over my head and punish me for it. It's done. It's over with. He's covered it. He went to me privately, one-on-one, -on -one, showed me the error of my ways, and then covered it. We've never dealt with it since. Now, some of you this morning might be wondering how it is, how it is possible that someone could possibly overlook an offense, especially when that offense has wounded you deeply. Some of you have been wounded deeply in this room by people who are close to you. And you may be wondering, how can I possibly forgive or overlook or cover over that offense? How can I do that? Well, I can tell you this morning that it doesn't come from within. It doesn't come from looking into your own heart. It doesn't come from looking into your own heart and trying to drum up the strength to forgive or ignore or, or overlook the offense. 
That's not where it comes from. Left to our own devices, we don't actually have the resources to cover over an offense. Left to our own devices, we're going to gossip about it. We're going to stew over it. We're going to punish the person for it. We're going to give them the cold shoulder. That's what will happen left to our own devices. Instead, the ability to cover over an offense comes from recognizing that that is how God has dealt with each and every one of us in Christ. It comes from recognizing that God in Christ has covered over our offenses. Through the death of Jesus Christ, God has removed the offense of our transgressions and our sins, and now he has cast them into an ocean of forgiveness and mercy and grace. Listen to what Micah chapter 7 verse 19 says. God will have compassion on us. He will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Psalm 103, 12 says, God says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Hebrews 8, 12 says, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. You see, that's where the strength to cover over an offense comes from. It comes from recognizing that in Christ, God has done the same thing to us. He's covered over our offenses. And not only has God covered up our offenses, our sins through the death of Jesus, but like Proverbs 17, 9 says, God is now committed to never repeating the matter. He's not going to hold it over our heads He's not going to throw those past sins back in our faces. He's not going to dredge up our history or remind us of the many ways that we have failed him. Why? Because they're covered. They're covered by Jesus. He has cast them into an ocean of forgiveness. And there, he says, he will remember them no more. Their history. They're done. Never to be brought up again. This morning, that's where the strength to cover over an offense comes from. It comes from recognizing that in Christ, God has covered over our offenses. Well, let's pray, and let's thank God for his mercy and grace. Father, we pause for a moment. We thank you for your mercy, your compassion, your grace toward us in Jesus Christ. God, thank you for covering over our offenses and for remembering them no more. We pray, Father, that in our relationships that we would do the same that we would go to the well that is Christ and we would draw from that well and find the strength to cover over offenses, to overlook a slight, because we recognize what you first have done for us. We thank you for this great grace and salvation, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Close our service. We're going